Well, my name is Brandon. I'm one of the pastors here. If you're if you're new, I'd love a, a chance the chance to meet you. And one of the things that you should know about me is uh, whether you care to or not. I love golf, like um, like too much, an unhealthy amount. And I, I just wanted to, to share a story with you real quick because a few weeks ago I had a life changing event that happened on a golf course. And you might think a single golf shot, golf shot can't be life-changing, and I would tell you that you are wrong, because it can. And uh, I was at Hillcrest. If you don't love golf, or you don't care about golf, just bear with me for a second, okay? I have a golf story. But it was a par five, hole number 11. It's kind of a downhill, dog leg to the right. I hit a great drive to the left side of the fairway. I had 205 yards into the pin, into some wind, Okay, there's water in front, there's trees to the left and right. It's a pretty difficult shot. If you don't know golf, if it's a par five, that means you try to make it in five shots. Okay, that's kind of your goal. And uh, so so I'm going for the green in two. I hit a three iron and it was beautiful, like a laser beam to the pin. And then it then it happened. Okay, I I never saw it bounce, but I did. I did hear it. It hit the pin. I heard, heard the clank of the pin getting hit. And I was like, oh, my gosh, I just hit the pin. Right? And there's no telling where that ball went. It could have bounced any which way. So, so I get up to the green. I've got my wedge and a putter because I figure I'm going to have to chip onto the green. There's no ball. So I look in the cup, and it is in the cup. Okay? Yeah. I mean, yeah. I wish y'all would have been there because I could have used some applause when it happened. <laughs> it was a big moment. And here's the thing. It's not just that I made the shot. It's that... There was no ball marks on the green. It literally hit the pin and dunked into the cup, okay? I'm not sure that's ever happened in the history of the world, okay? I've never seen it on TV. Um, it, it's, so, so all that to say, I'm leaving ministry to pursue professional golf. Yeah, I'm just kidding. I, I'm just kidding. I, I am definitely a below average golfer. I mean, I'm probably better than you are, but still average, Okay. Uh, but that's a two. That's a two on a five. That's, a, that's an albatross is what they call it. It's, it's a very, very rare occurrence. But, but here, here's, here's what I know. Because if, if, if you know me and we have conversations outside of here and I know that you care about golf, you've probably heard me tell that story, okay? Because I was very excited about it. I told a lot of people. Uh, here, here's, here's what I know. If you are passionate about something, if something happens to you that, that excites you or, or something has made your life better or changed your life, you're just, you're just pumped about whatever it is. You tell people about it. It's just, it's just in our nature, right? We, we all have these things in our lives. Like, you want to talk about the Cowboys? Okay, this is probably the year they win it all, but also probably not, right? Uh, you want to talk about the Spurs? Wimby is not, uh, he's from another planet, and it's amazing to watch. We, we bought a, a vacuum cleaner that changed our lives, a Dyson V10 pet, and uh, it's amazing, you have these things in your life, too. What about your dumb Stanley Cup that you can't quit posting pictures of? <laughs> it's in our nature. We want people to experience what we have, except, it seems, when it comes to Jesus. When it comes to our, our faith. I mean, has he changed your life or not? I mean, he didn't just change it. If you, if you were a Christian, you belonged to him. He didn't just change your life. He didn't just make your life better. He saved your life. So you, you've probably heard this analogy before, but I'm going to use it again because it's perfect. But let's imagine for a second you have been found guilty of murder, and you did it. I don't know who it was. Hopefully not who you're here with. But you killed someone, and you're, you're guilty of murder, and you've been sentenced to death. And just before they put the needle in your arm, the judge himself steps down and says, no, 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 I'm going to die in his place. And he, he takes your punishment. He gets put to death in your place. Would you not leave that place and tell everyone you knew what happened? Would you be afraid of saying something wrong or being embarrassed or not, not, not having the right answers to their question? No, you wouldn't. You would tell everybody you came in contact with, you won't believe what he did for me. See, the major, this is, this is just a problem with, with Christians, especially in the Western world and in our country. You know, 
Clayton at the end of the Luke series, he posed that question. When was the last time you shared your faith? When was the last time that, that you told someone about Jesus, led someone to Christ? There's a lot of us that invite people to church and that's good, right? That's awesome, but that's, that's not all we're called to do because it's not church people that go to heaven like Clayton says all the time. Salvation comes through faith in Christ alone from, from hearing the gospel and, and they're not gonna accept the gospel unless they hear it. And, and again, like he said last week, a lot of you think and, and behave in this way like, well, that's your job, right? To, to share the gospel. We bring them to you, you share the gospel with them. Uh, but, but again, as he said, that's, that's a lie that we've all bought into. It, it's not just our job, people in the profession of ministry to share the gospel. That command has gone out to every single follower of, of Jesus. It's our job to equip you to do the work of the ministry. And so we're doing our best in this series to, to convince you of that and to equip you to do ministry. In fact, that's the, the big idea for the series is this, followers are fishers. If you're a follower of Jesus, you are a fisher of men. You, you are called to reach people in your life, to share the gospel, to, to be Christ's ambassador. And there's so many people, and you're, you might be one of these, that just, there it is. Let's pray. God, we lift up Clayton to you. And we just ask you to, to comfort him in this moment, to heal his body. God, we pray for, for rest, for peace for the family. God, we ask you to, to do what only you can do. God, do, do a miracle. God, we pray that you would get the glory. In your name, amen. So, you might be one of them that feels like you, you don't have the tools necessary. Like you, you're not comfortable sharing the gospel with people. It's a little bit intimidating to you. And here's what I know, though. If you attend this church on a regular basis, guess what? You hear the gospel every single week. Whether you realize it or not, it's, it's every single week. It's very, very clear the gospel presentation is shared. It, but, but there is a difference between hearing it and saying it yourself. I, I get that. It can be intimidating. You, you don't want to leave anything out, right? You don't want to say anything wrong. You might end up making somebody a Mormon or something on accident. Um, but I'm just, I'm telling you, it's simpler than you think. And what we're going to do today is I'm going to teach you practically uh, the, one of the most common tools for sharing the gospel. A, 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 few, a few key verses to kind of show you how to lead someone into the truth of the gospel. It's called the Roman road. You've probably heard of it. And actually, through all the research I did, most people say the Romans road, and I just can't do it, so I'm not going to. So Roman road is what I'm gonna say, even though it's probably, probably wrong. There's four different Romans verses, right? We're gonna go through them all, Romans 3.23, 6.23, 5.8, and 10.9. And uh, we're gonna teach you today your ABCs, the, the ABC of the gospel, of sharing the gospel. So if you have a Bible, we're gonna be in Romans, starting in chapter three. If not, it'll be on the screen. I wanna encourage you, especially today, there's a lot of blanks, a lot of points, and a lot of information, resources that you're gonna probably want in our message notes. So if you go to the app under message notes, it's all right there for you. And you're gonna wish you did if you don't, so. All right, Romans 3.23. So this is one we've all heard before. For everyone has sinned. We all fall short of God's glorious standard. So this is where we have to start. This is where it all begins. We gotta get this one right. We have to agree on this or there's nowhere to go from here, okay? We have to, number one, A, that's the A of the ABCs, admit. We have to admit that we sin, that everyone has sinned. Admit that we're a sinner. No one can claim that they're righteous just based on their own behaviors or their own sense of, of goodness or obedience or whatever because everyone has sinned and fallen short of what God demands. What does he demand? He demands no sin. <laughs> no sin. That means perfection. So what is sin? Let's define sin. Sin is when someone violates or disobeys or even just fails to obey the known will of God as revealed in scripture. It's when we don't do things his way. So does the size of the sin matter? No, not really when we're talking about separation from God. The smallest, most seemingly insignificant sin is enough to separate you from a holy God. But most of us, if we wanna admit it, 
we think we're pretty good, right? You probably think you're one of the best people that you know. You think that in your head. I know that, I know that you do, that I'm good and I'm better than most people. But what actually matters is how good you are compared to God's standard of good. Who gets to decide the standard? God does. You don't. God does. Your standard of good enough doesn't really matter. <laughs> Only God's standard does. His standard is the one that matters. So, so let's look at what is, what is his standard for good. Let's go back to the Big Ten, the original. Exodus chapter 20, verse 3. The, the Ten Commandments. Let's, let's measure ourselves against the Ten Commandments. Let's do it. Verse 3, you must not have any other God before me. So, so simply, God demands loyalty, covenant loyalty, the, the one true God of heaven and earth. He will not tolerate the worship of any other kinds of gods. And that, that kind of goes along with the next one. Verse 4, you must not make for yourself an idol of any kind or an image of anything in the heavens or on earth or in the sea. And you might be thinking at this point, dude, I'm not out there worshiping trees or something, right? Like, I'm not an idolater. I'm not worshiping idols. So you mean to tell me that you never put anything else before God in your life? You never worship anything else with your time, your attention, your, your energy, your, your money? Interesting. What about verse 7? You must not misuse the name of the Lord your God. Uh-oh. So, so not just talking about cussing here, right? But although don't do that. It's referring primarily to, to someone taking a deceptive oath in God's name or invoking God's name in a sanction to act, which the person is being dishonest. It also bans using God's name irreverently, disrespectfully. He's warning Israel against using his name as if it were disconnected from him, from his person, his power, his presence. And you've definitely done that one, Okay. Maybe like calling yourself a Christian but not really living like, like one. That, that, that might qualify. What about verse 8? Remember to observe the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. God is, is trying here to, to form the people's life in the rhythm of working for six days, resting on the seventh day as a Sabbath. This, this started with the instructions for collecting manna. Remember when they were wandering in the desert. Every aspect of their life was to reflect that they belong to the Lord and are sustained by his hand. Is that true of your life? Does your life and, and rhythm reflect that you belong to him, that you're sustained by him? Verse 12, honor your father and mother. Sorry, mom and dad. I've definitely messed this one up. They're here. But not just talking about sassing your parents here, right? We're, we're, it's a little bit more than that. It's talking about pre, treat, treating someone with the proper respect in regards to the parents. This means treating them with deference, providing for them, and, and looking after them in their old age. Number 13, you must not murder. That's an easy one, right? But as the great philosopher Lee Corso says, not so fast, my friend, because Jesus took this one to the next level. You remember the Sermon on the Mount. What did he say about murder? He says, you've heard it said, do not murder, but I tell you, if you hate someone in your heart, it's the same thing. Uh-oh. Hate equals murder. What about you must not commit adultery? Again, duh, right? But again, Jesus took it to the next level. What did he say about adultery? You've heard it said, do not commit adultery, but I tell you, if you look at someone with lust in your heart, it's the same thing. Not looking good for us. Verse 15, you must not steal. You must not testify falsely against your neighbor. You must not covet. Look, I'm pretty sure you're all great people, but after reading all that, I'm pretty sure you're all very, very guilty. Why? Because when it comes to, to oneness with God, right, the way he intended it from the beginning, the standard is perfection. That there, there is no such thing as good enough. Good enough is not good enough to have a relationship with God. In fact, I'd be willing to go a little further. Like, you've all probably said or done or even thought something today since you got to church that would be enough to separate you from a holy God. Were it not for the finished work of Jesus on the cross. 
So here, here's, here, here's the facts. You, we're all gonna stand before God one day as idolaters, liars, cheaters, murderers, adulterers. Will we be found guilty or not guilty? Well, we're all guilty. So what does that mean if we're guilty? Does that mean heaven or hell? It means hell. And that leads us to the, the next stop here on the, on the road. Romans 6, 23, this is the first part of, of that verse. The wages of sin is death. So, so we have to admit that we're a sinner, right? But also, there's a penalty to be paid for our sin. The wages of sin is death. Admit I'm a sinner. We're talking about wages here. This is a return for, for, for labor, like a payment for something that you do. In this case, what you did was sin, and what you earned was death. Again, we, we don't get to decide the standard, and we also don't get to decide the penalty. God does that. If you break man's law, you pay man's fine. You break God's law, you pay God's fine. With your sin, with all of our sin, we, we have offended an infinitely holy and righteous God. So the fine is infinite in its nature. The fine is, is holy in its nature. God's fine for sin is eternal death. So, so, so anyone who sins without the forgiveness through, through Jesus, they're, they're going to die both physically and a spiritual death, an eternal spiritual death. Whereas Christians, Jesus followers, we're going to get to in a second, we're promised eternal life. The, 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 this, this punishment for sin isn't just what you earned, but again, we have to get this through our minds. It's what we deserve. Sin earns you death like we deserve death. Sin deserves death. You know what the, the biggest problem with us is when it comes to this? We undervalue our own sin and we overvalue our own goodness. We're just, we're just not that, that bad. But we don't get to decide. Like what we think doesn't, doesn't alter what's true we deserve death because of our sin. Look at the person next to you and say, you deserve death. It doesn't feel good, does it? It's true. That's the reality. Even as good as you are, even though you're the best person that you know, it's not going to be enough. That's why the good news is so good. And thankfully, the second half of that verse, verse 23, brings us some good news with a big old but. In verse 23, he says, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. That's the good news. Admit we sinned, admit there's a punishment for our sin, that, that is death, and then the B. The B is believe. Admit we're sinners and then believe that Eternal life comes through Jesus alone, not our own goodness, not our own effort, not our own good behavior or whatever, not our church attendance, but through Jesus. This is a free gift. See, you see the language here, the wages of sin, right? And then now you have a free gift. A free gift is the opposite of a, of a wage. In fact, in Romans chapter four, if you want to read it on your own, Paul goes into great detail, you know, des describing the difference between the two. How when someone works, their wage, it's not a gift, right? Because they, they earned it. But in God's kingdom, to be counted as righteous is not something you can earn. It is impossible to earn it. It is a free gift from God based only on faith in Jesus' finished work on the cross. And that work on the cross was the greatest display of love that the world has ever Known. This is the scandal of grace. The next verse. Wrap your brains around this. Romans chapter 5, verse 8. But God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. That's love. See, God's love doesn't fit in the same category of our, of our human love. Like it's, it's, it's in another world of its, its own. It's a different kind of love. He didn't just die for the good ones. He didn't just die for the ones that would turn to him. He didn't just die for the ones that, that, that would, would follow him. He, he died for everyone. Even the worst of sinners, the ungodly, the guilty people, 
living in willful rejection against God, those that would mock him. He himself said at the very end, I didn't come for those that think they're sick. I came for, I mean, those who think they're healthy. I came for those who know that they're sick. And it's not just, it's not just Jesus' love displayed on the cross. It's, it's God's love. It was his plan that put all of this in action so that he could have a relationship with you. The whole thing is motivated by his love for you. Did you know God loves you? He loves you. He loves you more than anyone else in your life has ever loved you. He loves you more than anyone else in your life could ever possibly love you. He loves you with a a perfect love. And he didn't just say it, he showed it. He proved it. Think about that. He, he, He didn't wait to see if you would serve him or turn to him or be faithful to him or would curse him or run from him or go the other way or whatever, would reject his son. He didn't wait for any of that. He died for you. He offered forgiveness, his free gift of forgiveness. He made the first move. He didn't wait for you to come to him. And it, we, we tend to think of the gospel as like this for all mankind kind of thing, which it obviously is, right? But it's also very, very, very personal. He died for you as an individual. He knows your name. But to admit we're a sinner, believe Jesus died for our sin and now the C, confess, confess. Romans 10, nine, if you openly declare that Jesus is Lord, you believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. A lot of translations say, if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. This is where so, so, so many of us get it twisted, right here. Confessing with your mouth, Clayton touched on this last week, Confessing with your mouth doesn't mean that by some, you know, saying of some magic words that you're automatically in the club. Confession is a part of this outward evidence of this inward faith that you have, right? But, but Paul also isn't saying that people only need to believe, right? Believe that Jesus died, but it's not just about believing that an event happened either. You don't get in the club that way automatically. He said last week, Clayton said, This this ask Jesus into your heart prayer that that we've all heard growing up is not in Scripture. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that if that was you as a child and you prayed that prayer, that doesn't mean that you're not saved, but it definitely doesn't guarantee that you are because reciting words isn't enough. We, We aren't a people that believe that some incantation can save you and make you right with God. See, here's the problem. And I have a lot of friends that fall into this category. We, we want Jesus as Savior. Like, wait, I don't, I don't want to go to hell, right? So yeah, sign me up for the, the Savior part because that kind of sounds like a nightmare. Everybody wants to be saved, right? But Lord, Lord of my life? Like, like what am I going to have to give up? But my, my life, everything, man, that seems a little steep, right? No, instead, I think I'll just hang my hat on one or two verses taken out of context and stick with my come into my heart prayer I said when I was six and live under this delusion my entire life that I'm good with God and headed to heaven even though there isn't one shred of evidence in my life that I belong to anyone but myself. Remember, Clayton said this a lot in the past. If we're going to study Scripture exegetically, this is as opposed to eisegetically. Eisegetic study is where we read in ourselves into whatever Scripture it is so that we make ourselves feel better about whatever sin or rebellion against God that we're, we're doing. We want Scripture to line up with it, right? So we kind of twist things. We take things out of context. But if we're going to read it the right way, We have to look at not just one verse, but the the, the totality of verses on whatever subject it is. So so this, I prayed a prayer when I was six crowd, must have missed this next verse in James chapter two, verse 19. You say you have faith, for you believe that there is one God. I love this. Good for you. (laughs) 
Well, good for you. Even the demons believe this. And they tremble in terror. How foolish. Can't you see that faith without good deeds is useless? That seems pretty clear to me. You might say, wait, wait, is James saying that if I don't do this good deed and that good deed or whatever, then I'm not saved? No, no, that's what your religious ears hear. What he's saying is that if you are saved, there will be evidence in your life that proves it. It's not just pray a prayer and then live how you want to live the rest of your life. That, that's, there, 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 there's no saving faith there is what he's saying. Like That isn't real faith. Part of confessing is, is repenting, turning from your sin, turning to him, making Jesus Lord of your life is saying, Jesus, I'm with you no matter what. I'm gonna take up my cross and follow you every single day. My life is not my own. It's yours. A real faith is a trusting faith. You might have heard this analogy, but it's my favorite one. It's the, the clearest representation of what a trusting faith looks like. But as the legend, legend goes, I don't know how much of this is true, but it still makes a point. In the late 1800s, there was a guy named uh, Charles Blondine, and he was a tightrope walker, and he would walk across Niagara Falls on this, this tightrope, and there would be crowds of people that would gather to see this, this crazy stunt, right? And he asked them, one day, how, how many of you believe that I can cross this, this tightrope pushing a wheelbarrow? And they're like, lose their minds. Like, oh my God, yeah, we believe, we believe. And then he asks, how many of you believe that I could cross this tightrope pushing a wheelbarrow with someone in it? Oh my gosh, they can't believe it. Like, we believe, we believe. And then he asked for a volunteer. So, there's a difference in believing something and putting your faith in something. Real faith is a trusting faith, saving faith. It's, it's active. It's, it's I'm making Jesus Lord of my life. I'm trusting him with me. Summary. A, admit you're a sinner. B, believe Jesus died for your sin, and then C, confess Jesus is Lord. Those are the ABCs of the gospel. So we're gonna get extremely practical now, just for a second, okay? And then we'll, we'll close with some big ideas, but you guys have people in your life that you love that don't know Jesus, or maybe at the very least, you're just not sure, right? And you, you need to be sure. And so we're gonna give you a few example starter conversations. Like how do I, how do I take this conversation and turn it into a spiritual bent, right? That can be a, a, an intimidating thing to do. So here's, here's a few example starter questions. Number one, you can ask somebody, do you have faith? Do you have a faith in something? Do you, do you attend a church somewhere? That's, a, that's not a scary question to ask, right? It's a really easy way to kind of turn the conversation. I like this one. Do you know for sure that if you die, you'll go to heaven? Probably don't ask this one to someone that you just met in the grocery store, okay? Uh, but maybe God will lead you to, you know? You don't know. You gotta, you gotta be willing, gotta be ready, gotta be listening for the Lord to lead you. But here's the, here's the good thing about this question. Their answer is gonna tell you everything you need to know. What are they probably gonna say? Yeah, I, I think so. I'm a, pretty good, I'm a pretty good person. And that's your cue to start with A. Admit you're a sinner. And then the B and the C, right? Would, would you mind if I shared my story with you? See, see, if someone's sharing a struggle that they're having in their life with you, this is a perfect invitation for you to share with them. Share your story. We're gonna talk about that a lot next week, so, so don't miss it. It's a great question to always have in your, in your back pocket. What's your story? Who were you? 
before you met Jesus? What, what, what did he do in your life? What, what's he doing in your life now? Share your story. So what if someone tells you, all right, I'm ready. Tell me, how must I be saved, right? They're, they're like, they want to commit their life to Jesus. What do you say then? So this, this might be a dumb thing. I don't know. I thought it might be helpful. So I, I wrote out a paragraph, all right? And it's in, the, it's in the notes. It's in the message notes. This is like an example conversation. This, this is how you put all the ABCs together in one, just a few sentences that you can literally memorize and repeat, okay? So here's what, here's what I would say. Paul said in Romans 3.23, if you don't remember all these references, don't worry about them. You can look it up later. Paul said in Romans 3.23 that everyone has sinned. We, we've all fallen short of God's standard, which is perfection. Are you perfect? I'm certainly not. And that's a problem because to fall short of God's standard means death, not just a physical death, but a spiritual one. An eternity separated from God in a place called hell. These are the wages of sin, but... Right, But, this is the good news, God showed his love for us by sending Jesus to pay that fine. And he didn't wait for us to come to him. He made the first move. That's how much he loves us. This is a free gift he is offering to each of us. Now, all I have to do is reach out and take the gifts by believing that he died for me, he rose from the dead. By trusting in his payment for my fine and not my own goodness, and by repenting, turning from my sin and making him Lord of my life. Committing my life to Jesus means going his way and not my own. It's just a few sentences. But, Brandon, what if they ask me about the six-day creation? What if they ask me about Noah and the ark? What if they ask me about Adam and Eve? You know, it's, it's okay to say I don't know. That's fine, but that's not what it takes to make you a Christian. What it takes to make you a Christian is believing Jesus rose from the dead. That's it. It's okay to say, I don't know, but what I do know is I was blind, but now I see. You can worry about the other stuff later. Because without a resurrection, there is no Christianity. There is no Jesus following if he, if he didn't rise, then, then all of this is pointless. That's why we have the City 7, by the way, that we're teaching you every single week. We're teaching your kids in every environment. This week is number two. And by the way, it's perfect. Here's something you can say if, if they want to question these other things. You say, listen, it's about the resurrection. Are there sources outside the Bible that confirm the biblical account of Jesus' resurrection from the dead? Let's read it together. Many Roman and Jewish historians have confirmed that the apostles died as martyrs for preaching that they saw Jesus risen from the grave. No one dies for something they know to be a lie. This isn't just a blind faith kind of thing. Even the disciples didn't believe until they saw him face to face. They, they didn't have a blind faith that led them to their, their deaths. They saw him alive. And it's not just the Bible that says it. It's the biggest evidence for, for the resurrection that there exists. It's, it's powerful if you think about it. So what about some other resources? Here, here's some books you can suggest to your friends. Clayton talked about the guy in the lobby. He read Case for Christ. That's one of the books you could, you could recommend to someone. If you look in the message notes, there's links, Amazon links to all of these books that you can even order if you want. Case for Christ and, and evidence that demands a verdict. See, Lee Strobel and Josh McDowell were both atheists that decided to do some research. And they were convinced by the evidence, not, not blind faith or someone else's story, by the evidence that Jesus rose from the dead. They're, they're Christians now. The case for resurrection of Jesus, that's a good one too. So, so surely through all of this, if you, if you do some studying, you put some effort into this, like you have all the tools you need to have an answer. So you should be fluent, gospel fluent, right? So now what? That's my big idea today. Always be on mission. Guys, this is, this is so huge. How many opportunities do we walk past because we're not listening or because we're afraid 
that this is the starting point of sharing your faith, like step one, be ready. You never know when God is gonna ask you to open your mouth and speak for him. 2 Corinthians chapter five, verse 20, we are Christ ambassadors. Clayton talked about this last week some. He's, God is making his appeal, not through Clayton or me or whoever else, through us. He's making his appeal through all believers. Like you are his ambassador in your circles. You, you live for his kingdom. You serve his kingdom, not, not your own. Not just on Sundays, but every single day of your life. Everyone you come in contact with, you, you are always on duty. You represent him, right? So, so we have to be ready. This is 1 Peter chapter 3. He says it very clearly. And if someone asks about your hope as a believer, what does he say? Always be ready to explain it. That means be prepared. That's what we're doing today. We're preparing ourselves to have the answers. And now we're, we're ready to explain it if someone asks or if we have an opportunity. But do this in a gentle and respectful way. Listen, you don't have to be the dude on the corner screaming at the top of his lungs that everyone's going to hell. In fact, I don't find that to be that helpful of a, of a plan. Not very effective. But in the context of your life, the relationships you already have, in the normal rhythm, in the flow of your life, be on mission. Be ready. You are in their lives for a reason. Wherever you go, especially, listen, especially when you're gonna be in the presence of people that you're not sure where they stand or maybe you know where they're standing and it's not in a good spot. Like when you know you're gonna be around them in a social setting, be ready. Give yourself a little pep talk in the car on the way over there. Like I'm gonna be listening. When you start looking for those opportunities, that the door cracked open just, just a little bit, like looking for that door to be open to, to maybe steer that conversation in a little bit of a more serious direction, you will be amazed at how many there actually are. I promise you. I, I've, I've lived this the last few years. It, it's intimidating, I get it. Like my whole life, <laughs> growing up in church, man, in the youth group, if, if they used the word witness, I was like, no thank you. You know, it's like, witness to your friends. Like, it was so intimidating for me. Why? I'm, I'm a very, very introverted person. Like, I, I get freaked out about just normal one-on-one -on -one conversations, much less if I'm talking about someone's eternity, right? It was a lot for me. But the, the more I began to understand the gospel, like we talked about in the first series, the urgency of the gospel the emergency. You just can't, just can't wait anymore. How, how heartless do we have to be to, to have the gospel in us and to keep it to ourselves? And I've, I've learned you don't, you don't have to do things perfectly. You don't have to say things perfectly. You just have to be obedient. And again, you, there's, there's times I'm amazed at the things coming out of my mouth because the Holy Spirit's leading me in those conversations. He, he'll, he's not gonna leave you hanging. I've had difficult conversations with loved ones even, like family members, friends, during a round of golf, sitting in, in somebody's pool like two o'clock in the morning, you know, like wanting to go to bed, but just waiting for an opportunity. And they always come up. I, I've been literally sitting at the side of, of someone on their deathbed, making sure he was, he was good. But you won't get that opportunity with everyone. Years ago, I preached a, a sermon at Experience Life, and this is right after the, these terrorists had just beheaded like 30 Christians on the beach. I don't know if you remember that. And I made the mistake of watching it and we clipped it and the, the clip went like stupid viral on Facebook, like millions of views. And I got friend requests from scary places. <laughs> you know, I was like, I don't know if I made myself a target or what, but it was reaching a lot of people. But what, what I think resonated with people is in this clip, 
I said, there are people, this isn't just a, a Bible thing. There are people right now dying for their faith. And we aren't even willing to be embarrassed for ours. Inconvenienced. Like what, what is wrong? Followers are fishers. Disciples make disciples. Here's some challenges that Clayton gave us last week. Invite someone to church. That's an easy one. We should all be doing that. Pray for someone. Don't just say, praying for you. Pray for them. A good first step for that is do it via text. Type out a prayer. Via, hey, I'm praying for you. Here, you type out a prayer. God, I'm praying for whatever, and you send it to them. That's, a, that's an easy way to get your foot in the door, praying for somebody. Share your story. We're talking about that next week. Take Discover 101. This is a class that we're offering as part of, of midweek, starting in a couple of weeks, that it's about basic discipleship, right? Part of basic discipleship is, is sharing your faith, learning, getting, getting more and more tools and, and how you can be used by God in your life. You know, as Clayton said, that the effectiveness of our church is not measured by how many people are in the seats, how many spectators we have, but how many are in the game, how many disciple makers are out there fishing. It's not about seating capacity, but sending capacity. Listen, I've had conversations with very good friends of mine that chose to leave this church because of the tough messages. You know, people that are in the, I pray to prayer crowd don't like some of the things that we teach because it's scripture. And he would tell me, good luck getting people to come. And I said, that's not our goal. It's not to grow a big church. We're, we're here to make faithful disciples of Jesus, to, to equip you and your family to be faithful disciples of Jesus. And in the church in America, for the most part, has, has watered down the gospel in, in favor of this kind of seeker-sensitive mentality, like just get, them, just get them in the door, try to attract them. And I've been on that side of the fence, but I'm telling you what I've seen in my life is that produces watered-down Christians. that are ineffective for the kingdom. And again, my belief, part of the reason we've lost a generation to the world. Our church family will live for what matters most in eternity. I, we, we, we know at the city, our existence isn't just about this life. There, there is more to it than that. We're gonna live in light of eternity. We're gonna be a church that is on mission because it's that important. Clayton said it last week. He will never let us. We won't let us settle for anything less. We're never going to stop challenging you to be a disciple that makes disciples, to, to, to turn from your sin, to, to live in light of eternity. We will be a city on a hill that cannot be hidden. Would you pray with me? God, we we thank you for the truth of the gospel. I mean, if we could just get in touch with the, the, the truth of the gospel like we have today, if we could do that every day of our lives, man, how much different would we live? Father, I pray that we would be blown away at your love for us, that you saved us, and that we would not be able, just, just like the, the apostle said, in Acts over and over, like we can't stop and we won't. Maybe you're here and as we're, we're going through the, the ABCs there, you, you've seen some flaws maybe in your own, in your own theology, in your own thinking. And the beauty of it is you have an opportunity right now, no matter what you believed in the past or where you thought you might end up, you know, or how good of a person you are or how much church you got under your belt. Like, none of that matters. Have you responded to the gospel of Jesus? Have you gotten in the wheelbarrow? 
And if you have, today is your day, man. Don't waste another second of this life. Put your faith in what he did for you on the cross, not your own goodness. And don't just trust in him as savior, but make him Lord of your life. Jesus, I'm going with you. And I pray, Lord, that as all of us leave this place, this wouldn't be one of those things that just, as soon as we hit the, the cold wind outside, that it just blows off of us and we, we forget everything that we've been challenged by today. I pray that this is the day we make changes in our life. God, we, we don't want to just be hearers. We want to be doers of the word. God, challenge us. Just, just I pray that this week that all of us will spend time just, just looking at the Roman road and from just familiarizing ourselves with, with the language and and, and thinking about our story, like how, how would I share what God has done in my life with somebody? And then just commit to be ready, be on mission and be willing. God, all he wants is for us to, to be willing to be used. That's, that's the only requirement to be used by God in amazing ways is to say yes to him. That's it. You don't have to be the smartest or the most eloquent. So God, do that in our, our hearts this week. We want to be on fire, believers, for you that are, that are making disciples useful for your kingdom. And you may call us to, to walk up to a stranger if, if, if we're led. I pray that we would be obedient. But at the very least, God, in our, our own circles and the people that we love, don't let us just sit by and wonder. God, let this thing burn in us so much that we can't keep our mouths shut anymore. Whatever the cost, it's worth it. We want to live for you.